Thanks for joining us for another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here at the News Forum, where all voices matter. Today, we're going to delve into drones, the drone industry and drone warfare. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as China's activities and the situation in the Middle East, drones are coming into their own. Here to help us understand is Bradley Bowen. He is a director at the Center on Military and Political Power at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Boom and Bust. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you. So I guess my first question is, what are the latest developments uh, generally with drones that you've been tracking? You know, no, thank you. You know, drones have been in the uh, in the inventories of leading militaries for quite some time. I remember flying my Black Hawk helicopter as a U.S. Army officer in uh, the late '90s and having a drone behind me in the traffic pattern. So uh, they're not new, but uh, there's constant innovation, and they're becoming more and more prevalent. We obviously started to arm drones years ago, and now we're seeing smaller and smaller drones. And you're also going to, over time, see the integration of unmanned aerial systems or drones with artificial intelligence. Uh, and we see a lot of our adversaries, potential adversaries, moving that direction, where you may, need, may not even have human beings in the loop, if you will, making decisions. So the programming's there for this armed drone. It's out looking for a particular target, and they will actually attack that target with no human being making the final decision and pushing the big red button. Mm. And uh, I guess just give a, give our uh, viewers a sense. Uh, how big is this industry? What, what who are the drone leaders? You know, there's uh, you know I obviously focus on uh, U.S. defense policy strategy industry, and there's a, a number of, of companies, General Atomics and others, that make drones. Um, but you were not alone. I mean, you have uh, in Ukraine uh, uh, conflict that, uh, that all of us are watching. You have the TB2 drone, for example. This is a Turkish-made drone that has been provided to Ukrainian forces that's been quite effective. So to your viewers, some of these are would look like a, to the eye as a, like a small Cessna aircraft. They're that big and actually require runways to take off and land. And some of them, you like the switchblade drone, which is an American-made drone, you can actually put in a backpack and it'll launch it. Uh, just one person can launch it. It'll go hover over uh, a target for a while, and then actually conduct a kamikaze strike. Those are called loitering munitions. So they really come in all range, all, all different sizes, different capabilities, different areas of focus. They're becoming more prevalent, not less. And when you combine that uh, with uh, uh, a desire to close what's called the kill chain, the time between detecting a threat, deciding what to do, and delivering the desired effect of munition, uh, he who arrives with the most drones who can act the quickest will often have the advantage on the battlefield. Uh, is there one country who's deploying drones more than other countries, or is this a general trend uh, throughout all the militaries? It's a great question. You know, so you have countries that produce them, right? And then a lot of countries will export them. And this is something the United States has been concerned about, the, the international export market for drones, because we don't want these capabilities falling into the wrong hands. But unfortunately, in some ways, that horse has left the barn, if you will. So the U.S. is obviously a leading producer. I mentioned Turkey earlier. Russia produces drones. Turkey produces drones. And China is obviously producing drones. So really, in any future great power conflict, um, military planners on both sides of that conflict will have to assume that their adversaries will be wielding all types of drones, that they'll be armed, potentially powered by artificial intelligence, and they could be coming in swarms. I'm talking about not a few dozens or hundreds. And so we really are uh, beginning to live through the early stages of what would feel like a sci-fi movie. Yes. Is it is it uh, radically altering a military do doctrine at this point, Brad? It's a great question. We, we need a lot more time than we have to go through that. But I'd say generally speaking, again, from an American perspective, forgive me, you know, we've often assumed for decades that we own the skies. And that's why, um, you know, because we we're fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had air superiority. We really haven't, as Americans, we haven't had to worry about threats from the skies, more or less since the Korean War. That's all changing now as we're looking at China, particularly China. We can no longer safely assume that we will own the skies. And a large reason for that are these drone capabilities that we're talking about. Uh, absolutely. And obviously, this is a, a huge impact on uh, current uh, conflicts. We're going to talk about that a little bit after the break. I do want to drill down into, uh, obviously, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how that's affecting uh, the military and, and drone technology. We'll leave that because it is an important discussion until after the break. 
Please stay with us. We'll be back after these few words. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Bradley Bowman. He is uh, from the Center on Military and Political Power at the uh, FDD. Uh, Brad, I just, just want to delve a little bit deeper into uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, I think you've made the point that this really has been uh, a testing ground for new drone technology. Just sort of walk us through that in a little bit more detail, how this is affecting the conflict and uh, who's winning, who's losing as a result of the, the drone technology. Absolutely. So um, the the first phase of, of of the what I would call Putin's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, uh, you know, featured the the drive largely to to go after the capital Kiev, and that was largely a uh, consist of large convoys of armor personnel carriers and tanks getting stuck on roads, and and those uh, those convoys were sitting ducks, if you will, for airstrikes. Uh, and because the Russians, surprisingly for many, were unable to establish air superiority in Ukraine because for a lot of reasons, including the, the great work of the Ukrainians, um, Ukrainians were able to use, in some cases, the drones, including the TV-2 drones that I mentioned earlier that they received from Turkey, to strike some of these convoys that were sitting for days or weeks uh, on, these, on these roads coming from the north. And so... Um, that, that was extraordinarily effective. In, in, in some cases, if you're trying to stop a Russian offensive and it's going to cross a river with a bridge on it, by taking out that river, obviously you can slow that convoy down. So some of that can be conducted with uh, ground-to-ground artillery strikes. Uh, some can be conducted by manned aircraft, and Ukrainians thankfully still have some of those. And some of those can be conducted by drones. And so we've really seen kind of across the board, but including with drones, We've seen the Ukrainian armed forces operate in an agile, innovative, creative way uh, that's been quite impressive to behold, honestly. Uh, probably a lot of lessons being learned right there. Do you expect even more advanced drone uh, weaponry being deployed uh, by Russia and or Ukraine? Yes, I think anyone looking at what's happened in Ukraine, anyone considering uh, the facts that I've been laying out, Anyone looking at the war in Nagorno-Karabakh a few years ago, where drones played a, um, a, a very leading role in, in the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, what can come away, I think, dare I say, with only one conclusion, is that you want drones, you want a lot of them, and you want them fast. And so uh, I think anyone who's, uh, who has concerns for any, any nation state that has concerns for its security is already moving aggressively in that direction. And there's lots of people around the world uh, who are, are standing ready to provide them. And so uh, uh, our, our, our children and grandchildren are going to confront this threat. And as far as I'm concerned, we want the good guys to have better capabilities than the bad guys so we can deter war and, if necessary, win it. Uh, as we're speaking, of course, uh, President uh, Biden is on his way to uh, his Middle Eastern trip, including Saudi Arabia. There are reports that the Iranians are willing to sell their advanced drone technology to Russia. Is this something that you're concerned about as well? It is. And to me, that's a very tangible example of a larger grand strategic trend that I've been observing and been publishing a bit about. Um, a lot of times when uh, Americans, perhaps Canadians, think about great power competition, a term we throw around a lot, meaning, uh, at least from a Washington, D.C. perspective, China and Russia and the competition with them, we think, you know, hey, uh, th that, that competition with China happens in the Indo-Pacific. And that competition with Russia happens in Europe. Well, of course, those are the centers of, of those competition for those respective uh, uh, adversaries, I would call them. But the truth is, so is the Middle East. And, and, and frankly, uh, if, we ever, if the United States military pulls up stakes completely from the Middle East, uh, among those happily waving goodbye will be Russia, who has been there for many, many years, and also increasingly China. China, a lot of your viewers might say China. Well, absolutely. Last year, Iran and China signed a 25-year 20 year security agreement that included, among other things, technology transfer that relates to our drone conversation, military exercises, and more. And so we know that Iran, frankly, the Islamic Republic of Iran, in my view, is eager to kind of stick it to the West wherever they can. And supplying drones to Russia uh, evidently is a way they perceive that they can do that. So 
You know, there are important differences, of course, between Moscow, Beijing, and Tehran. I don't want to uh, paint with too broad a brush here. But it, to some degree, we, we see China and Russia closer than they've been since the 1950s. The U.S. intelligence community said that a few years ago. And we see Iran, China, and Russia conducting trilateral military exercises. Um, so there, there's much to be concerned about. We have finite resources we have to prioritize and mitigate risk. But the, the reality, whether we like it or not, is that our adversaries and potential adversaries are working together more, more than ever. Bradley Bowman is the Senior Director, Center on Military and Political Power at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. We're going to continue this very interesting conversation about uh, drones and drone warfare after the break. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. And we're back here with Bradley Bowman of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Uh, Brad, uh, we're just talking about the Middle East. I want to delve a little bit deeper in that, too, because, of course, we've seen uh, real-life examples of drone attacks on critical infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, for example. So uh, tell us a little bit about that background and how this uh, could be of concern to military powers uh, who have you know, infrastructure that uh, could be exposed, like the United States, for instance? It's a great question. We've seen uh, the aggressive use by the Islamic Republic of Iran and, and what I would call their terror, terror proxies in the Middle East for some time now, aggressive use of missiles, various types of missiles and drones. Uh, we've seen for years now, Iran smuggling illicitly weapons to their proxy force, the Houthis in Yemen. And, and the Houthis have conducted extraordinary attacks into Saudi Arabia. Now, many will hasten to add that, that Saudi Arabia has responded in, in ways at times that many of us would find troubling and, and, and not doing what we might want them to do to avoid civilian casualties. But I think a lot of that has improved over time from Riyadh's perspective. Meanwhile, this flow of illicit arms from Iran to the Houthis, including a drone capabilities continues. Uh, and that creates problems not only for Saudi Arabia, that's creating problems for Israel, for any, any vessel transiting the Red Sea, whether it be maritime or commercial. And I'd hasten to remind folks that the Houthis fired missiles at a U.S. warship in the Red Sea a few years ago. So this is a problem for global commerce, whether it's missiles or drones. It's a problem for Saudi Arabia, for Israel, for Egypt, for the United States, and, and any country, frankly, that relies on the unimpeded flow of, of commercial traffic through vital maritime choke points. And so these drones, you know, don't just think of them as something that's relevant to land warfare, right? They can also be used to attack maritime infrastructure. We've seen Hezbollah and Hamas try to use drones, both uh, uh, underwater drones, yes, those exist, and also uh, air drones, like we've been talking about, to, to attack ships at sea, offshore energy infrastructure, and other things. So this really is a comprehensive threat. And, you know, if, if, if for the students of history out there, there's this constant competition between the offense and the defense uh, uh, based on innovation over time. And I'd say right now we're in a moment where the offense increasingly has the advantage and Western militaries, including the United States, are playing catch up to try to field both the capability and capacities that we need when it comes to air and missile defense. Yeah, th this is a good point you raise, uh, offense versus defense. What, what is the defense for these uh, drone uh, attacks? Right. So the United States and, and, and Canada and our European allies have uh, amazing air and missile defense. The United States has the Patriot air and missile defense systems. We have the, the FAD system, an acronym for a system that has a little different purpose. Um, and, and the U.S. military back in the Cold War used to have a lot of air missile defense focused on kind of uh, uh, short term uh, uh, threats. The problem is that because we had this air supremacy, and I'd say we got a little lethargic and apathetic in dealing with this threat, there's a huge gap right now uh, in terms of protecting our ground forces from, uh, from cruise missiles, uh, from shorter range threats, including drones. And so we saw ISIS, for example, using drones to conduct, it's not just attacks, right? It's intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And then those are often quickly followed by attacks. And so you know, you can go down to your local store and buy a drone. And, you know, and, and we saw ISIS essentially getting commercially available drones and then attaching a grenade to it, right? And so this, you know, so we're talking about, oh, gee whiz, a lot of high tech stuff here, but some of this is just, uh, you know, commercially available. And so that that is just yet another reason why I think uh, as we're preparing for the future to make sure we're not surprised, we have to assume that these technologies will continue to proliferate 
and they will be uh, built and employed by our adversaries, and we better get ready now. Is Congress kind of looking at this as a way to regulate drones? Yes, uh, there, there, there's a robust effort in the Washington in Washington to to update policy related to the export of, of drones. There's also uh, comprehensive work being done on on counter drone, um, both uh, kind of for all the different types of drones I'm talking about, right? But to kill something, you have to first see it, right? And a lot of our radars are focused on threats coming in at a higher level. So if anyone saw the recent Top Gun movie, right, the whole, the whole premise there is you got to fly in low below the radar, right? The idea there is that if you go in low enough, a lot of the radars won't see you. That's what the radars won't see you. That's why the cruise missiles are such a formidable threat. They're easy to kill once you see them because most cruise missiles fly slow, right. but you have to see them to kill them. That means getting your radar up high, which is easier said, said than done. Uh, interesting conversation. We're going to continue. We have one more segment uh, with our guest, uh, Bradley Bowman, uh, Senior Director of the Center on Military and Political Power at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. So please stay with us. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. We'll continue our conversation with uh, Bradley Bowman. Uh, Brad, uh, uh, I, I just want to uh, just talk a little bit more about China. I know you mentioned that in a previous segment, but uh, uh, how is their strategy being altered by uh, all of this drone technology, and uh, what are the concerns that you have with that? Great question. You know, the, the, um, the United States, and I would say probably our allies, including Canada and others, have over time been the victim of what uh, many in the US government have called the largest theft of intellectual property in human history. Um, and a lot of this happened, frankly, why I think we were at this asleep at the switch, frankly. Um, and so through licit and illicit means, we've seen all kinds of technology across the full scope of weapons uh, being taken from Europe and North America and, and sent to uh, China uh, to build weapons, frankly, that will be used against us uh, our sons and daughters, uh, husbands, wives, grandchildren in future conflicts. And, and that's, that's a serious claim I just made. I think it's backed up by fact. And I think, so the first step is we have to realize that we can spend all the money we want in research and development to make sure the good guys have the best weapons. But if we don't protect that technology from being stolen, then we uh, inadvertently are simply arming our future adversaries or emboldening them to undertake aggression in places like the Taiwan Strait that they may be considering. And so, I would just flag that for your viewers as, as a leading concern that I'm watching. And, and a lot of this doesn't, uh, what I'm saying sounds very nefarious, and I think it is, but a lot of this presents itself in, in a less nefarious way. And by that, I mean, Beijing, the, the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Republic of China, has an explicit policy of military civil fusion, right. where they lead with a civilian or commercial face. But what, the explicit policy, their policy, explicit, not my words, but theirs, is that we're gonna use that among other things to funnel technology from the West directly to the People's Liberation Army. And if you add that to what I, what uh, the fact that the US military and our intelligence community believes that we could face aggression from Beijing in the Taiwan Strait in the next five to six years, that's a very sobering claim. So I'm all for investing what we need to do to make sure our drones are the best and that our, our troops have what they need to deter conflict. But as we're doing that, we have to protect that technology to not help our potential adversaries. Uh, I got to ask this because you did, you did mention Top Gun Maverick and uh, we were all blown away by uh, the, uh, the action there, but it does raise the question because drones are so much cheaper than fighter jets. Uh, is there still a need for fighter jets in a, in a modern yeah. army? And <laughs> it's a great force? question. You know, I'm a former helicopter pilot, so I don't have quite the investment in this. But uh, by the way, we, we do have what we call rotary wing drones that are being developed and filled uh -huh. in as well. So it's not just fixed wing drones, uh, just would add that. But uh, you know, there's pros and cons of both. What we have right now and have had for quite some time is, uh, is uh, at least in the US military and in a lot of our allies' militaries, we, we have a mix. We have manned and unmanned aircraft. Uh, and uh, that will continue for quite some time. We're actively building our next generation of fighters right now and in the U.S. and uh, are developing them, and a lot of them are manned. You know, uh, we, we, Western democracies tend not to like casualties, so that kind of pushes you in the direction of drones where you can send them into areas 
where they uh, uh, where they're going to get shot down. And you don't have to worry. Don't worry about the loss of life. For those who again back to Top Gun, right? It, it begs the question: Could they have done that with a drone? Right? right. We could talk about that. But so that's one of the big advantages of drones: is that you can save, uh, protect the lives of, of your war fighters. Um, and also the human body can only endure so much. So we can very quickly get to a point where the technology will allow uh, the aircraft, the unmanned aircraft, to, to maneuver in, in incredibly high Gs, flying to high speeds and turning at high speeds. And, and th that hardware is going to be able to endure more than a human body can. So, so it's not just about saving casualties. Mm -hmm. There's actually some employment reasons why you'd want to move over time in some cases uh, to drone warfare. But in the end, as, as countries that believe that there is an ethical component here, I, I, for one, think it's important to have wherever possible a man in the loop, man or woman in the loop, making some of these decisions. Um, but if you do that, you're going to slow down that kill chain that I talked about earlier. And I don't think Beijing is going to lose any sleep about those ethical concerns, right? So that's constantly pushing us in a direction where we're going to have to have some tough ethical questions as we make sure that democracies can defend themselves. Uh, Bradley Bowman, uh, been great uh, speaking with you. I, we could have gone on for another hour, uh, but I know you had to you had to leave a little bit early. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, very interesting for our uh, our viewership. Thank you, Tony. My my honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting discussion there with uh, Brad Bowman of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Obviously, drone warfare is here to stay. It's a huge industry and a huge part of the uh, the military, and will be talking about it in the future, I'm sure. Thanks for watching today.